Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. First, let me do a quick set of housekeeping notes. Uh, our event today is being recorded, and the recording and all the relevant links will be posted online afterwards. You are muted, but please type questions and comments into the question box at any time. We don't have a lot of time, but I'm getting notes about all of them, and it really is helpful for me, and I'll try to weave in the themes that I'm seeing in the questions and comments into the discussion wherever I can. And let me encourage you to join the conversation on Twitter. Just use the hashtag live at urban so everyone else following along can see what you think. Today's event is part of a series of discussions that we're holding with leading change makers and policy analysts on questions emerging from the COVID-19 crisis and the long overdue reckoning with our nation's ongoing structural racism. Today's event is a special edition as we're launching the Urban Institute's Racial Equity Analytics Lab, or REAL as we call it. I am so thrilled today to be joined by a great group and you'll find their bios online, so check there. Um, and we won't do much here. Um, Alonzo Plough, who is Chief Science Officer and Vice President of Research, Evaluation, and Learning at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Michael McAfee, who's President and CEO of PolicyLink. And in this first group, we're gonna discuss together the power of disaggregated data to help lawmakers lead an equitable response to the twin pandemics of COVID and racism and the economic crisis that they both have wrought for so many. A little later, we'll be joined by my colleague, Sheena Ashley, who's a vice president here at the Urban Institute and a member of the founding team for REAL. Also, Kelly Jin, incoming vice president of community and national initiatives for the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, who until days ago served as New York City's chief analytics officer and director of the mayor's office of data analytics. And very exciting, Candace Moore, who's a civil rights lawyer and advocate who is Chicago's first chief equity officer, an exciting trend that we hope to see many more cities emulate. They're gonna to talk together about how leaders are using disaggregated data right now to target COVID-19 response to communities needing the most aid and how together we can all build the regular practice of using timely disaggregated data and decision-making to keep a constant watch on how to close equity gaps and make sure we don't allow them to further widen. Throughout our conversations today, we'll be introducing you to REAL. And this is a new initiative at Urban that's seeking to provide race explicit analysis that can equip equity focused change makers with real time data to design and advance policies that are conscious of their racial impact. Drawing upon Urban's fabulous tech and data science team, REAL is deploying creative tools for matching and imputing demographic data to address the fact that in so many of our federal uh, public and private data sources used for policy analysis, we lack sufficient racial identifiers. Our goal is to overcome the barriers to empowering everyone from the activist to the policymaker with info at a small area level that's timely and specific to different populations. We launched REAL as a pilot in May of 2020, drawing on our own small pool of unrestricted funds. And since then, they've produced, among other products, a data tool using data from the Census Pulse Survey that makes it easy for researchers and change makers to assess, to assess racial and ethnic disparities across 10 indicators of well being for every state and the 15 largest metro areas in the US. And thanks to grant support from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the Salesforce Foundation, Reels moving forward with other high impact data tools based on imputation of racial identifiers into credit data, which would pro provide change makers with an early warning signs of financial distress for BIPOC communities and individuals. Ever mindful of the potential risks for disaggregated data to be produced and used in ways that could cause harm, the REAL team is also building a framework and a set of principles for assessing risks and ethical concerns around disaggregated data, and that'll be released later this spring. At its core, REAL was developed out of a belief that disaggregated data can help us to realize the power of knowledge, design more race conscious policies and programs, but that they also have a growing power to divide, marginalize, exclude, and reinforce abhorrent constructs of racism, if not analyzed with attention to context and structural forces. 
As policymakers have scrambled to design and adopt swift relief policies in response to the pandemic, we've seen a demand not only for data disaggregated by race and ethnicity, but available in real time at small geographies. And emerging data science tools can help us fill those gaps if we pair them with robust ethical guidelines, investments in data infrastructure, and engagement that moves leadership to action. These ideas, which we're very excited to be working on, build on the great work and uh, the real passion of other leaders who have been in the space for a long time. Um, particularly, there's foundational work that was conducted by our friends at PolicyLink with uh, the support of Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to make the case for data disaggregation to advance a culture of health. And so we're really pleased that we're gonna start today's discussion with Michael McAfee and Alonzo Plow. As I mentioned their bios before, uh, let me just skip right to the conversation. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, really honored that you would help us to launch this project. Um, Michael, I'm gonna start with you. Um, PolicyLink has long called for addressing racial inequalities in public policy by using tools like this, by really thinking consciously about how policy affects different populations. So what do you mean by the term disaggregated data and why is it so important for racial equity? We think disaggregated data is so important um, because it's real people, there are lots of lives behind that data. <laughs> that data tells us stories. And what we wanna be able to understand is the stories of specific groups of people that are often being left behind. And that's why disaggregating the data is so important for us. It gives us a richer insight into being able to act and hopefully to enact a new possibility. Um, you used a phrase, abhorrent constructs of racism. For us, when you disaggregate the data, you see that. <laughs> and what we're hoping for is that we begin to get a critical mass out here that understands that that data is telling us that people are being harmed um, and we're gonna be able to get beyond the politics to do something about it. The last thing I'll share is this, you know, when it comes to disaggregated data, we were in Pittsburgh um, a year or so ago and we were sharing some of our National Equity Atlas data and two women came up at the end of the presentation and they were crying. And they were crying because they said, we've been saying this for years and the data is telling the story that we've been trying to get people to listen to. And as we think about the power of data, I hope we all can sit with community, while they may not be using these fancy tools that we have at our disposal, they've been telling us this story of their pain and their suffering. And this is an opportunity now for us to, to hear that and to actually do something about it. So for us, disaggregating the data allows us to craft better strategy. That's great, thanks. And it, your critical point that there are, every piece of data is a person's life and it, that data can tell stories, but we also need to recognize the um, uh, expertise that exists in the lived experience of community that the data is uh, representing as well. Um, Alonzo, this is so much a part of RWJF's strategy. So why is disaggregated data so important to particularly responding to this pandemic? How, you, how have you been investing and focusing on data to inform your response? There, I, you know, we saw um, with COVID um, something that told us uh, we were on the right path with our focus on health equity uh, and our focus on developing meaningful data for action. Um, you know, the, as we know, the pandemic uh, was a confluence of the pandemic of a virus and endemic of racism. Those two things together create a pattern of unequal outcome, but we have a data system that isn't sufficiently robust or disaggregated to pick it up on the prevention side or act effectively when it's happening in real time. Uh, and I think that's the real challenge. It's, that's, it's disaggregation by race, ethnicity, but it's also disaggregation by place, geography, and even microgeography. I call it hyper-localized data. And COVID is so critical. When looking at COVID, you see what you need to know. You don't need, you need to know more than 
people living in apartments, you need to know how many people per room because that is the density element that tells you why there was so much spread uh, in low income communities that have been marginalized where they have more than two people per, uh, or per bedroom. Uh, so, I mean, I think the breakthrough that we need in our uh, health related and well being related data. Uh, is that kind of granularity that what Michael said tells the story with the right kind of granularity and sense of place. You know, as a former public health official in big places like Seattle King County in Los Angeles, uh, the, the county story was, was, too, uh, was, was too consolidated. Um, you know, we needed to know the story within South, South LA, the, uh, LA, the difference between Watts and Compton, uh, so we could begin to get at what to do. So I think the future of where we want to go are actionable data, meaningful data. But I would just want to add one more thing in, in, in this opening statement, not just disparity or how bad it is data, but you mentioned well-being data, asset data, uh, that allows us to understand how communities are thriving and how to build on that. So. Uh, data modernization is not just more uh, deficit mapping, it's also asset mapping. Asset mapping, and then I think also giving us tools to figure out how to deploy our, our, our resources to solutions as well. Um, exactly. And I think that's what's so, in some ways, exciting about this. Once you start to have disaggregated data, you can imagine if we take policy A and policy B, and you have to make a choice which one to pursue, if you can imagine one will have a disparity closing effect and another a disparity widening, you make a different choice if you put that information in front of decision makers. Um, and, and what a difference a week makes. Um, if we had held this uh, conversation um, uh, 10 days ago, we would not have a kind of national attention to this. Um, last week, I think you'd certainly both know, President Biden signed an executive order on advancing racial equity and support for underserved communities through the federal government. And in essence, its core principle is that in making federal uh, decisions, not a boutique set of uh, racial equity decisions over on the side and then we go about the rest of the business, but that as we are doing the business of government, we need to be mindful of equity at every turn. And we need to be thinking about each of these policy choices in those terms. Um, and so the executive order is full of strategies and steps to start agencies building capacity to assess the different programs they run, to build some tools that lots of different agencies can make. So I want to ask you to think each a little bit about that moment and that opportunity. Um, why don't we start with you, Alonzo? What are you, some of the biggest things that you think can come from this kind of focus on disaggregating data at the federal level uh, with the president's attention? Well, one of the things that's exciting about the executive order is it's reflecting um, a whole of government approach by the administration because the kind of health problems that confront us, uh, whether it's the pandemic, uh, we seem to forget about the opioid crisis that got, was the existential crisis that preceded it or climate and health, all of those issues uh, require a whole of government inter-department uh, approach uh, driven by the kind of uh, more meaningful and better disaggregated and uh, refined data that we've been talking about. Uh, because the, you know, uh, the issues that confront us in those three areas cut across all of the traditional ways we parse policy and programs uh, in government and require a level of coordination and also require a level of data coordination, a data, uh, informs, as I spoke about earlier, informs the residential density question, which is so important to the spread of a pandemic, right? Um, and so there are education and schools and pandemics, uh, our ability to open the schools is gonna require coordination and data across those sectors. So I'm excited both about the charge around uh, racial equity. Uh, I'm excited about uh, a president that spoke about the public health problem of white supremacy. I, th these are exciting times, I think, for us uh, who have been working on these issues for a number of years. Um, Michael, you and I have talked a lot about a, a concept that I think you've been putting out there, um, which is uh, equity scoring. Um, and this notion that uh, the policies, programs, and agency actions um, have 
demonstrable effects, um, but that we maybe don't always see them or we don't talk about them if we don't have data that tells us. I think we all know the uh, Trump administration uh, created the PPP program and they actually stopped collecting data that otherwise the Small Business Administration would have collected um, about the people who were receiving those loans. So can you talk a little bit about not only the, the power of having this data, but then you know, a, an architecture over time and infrastructure over time for decision-making that you're beginning to imagine? Yeah, you know, I think the executive order reflects more than 20 years of work from the equity leaders. Now the next 20 years of work is getting set up. The federal government is the locus of where this work needs to be won and lost. And when I say that, what I mean is this government has a chance now to begin to do the thing that it's never done. And that is to become anti-racist, to actually construct a government and institutions that can serve the all in our equity definition. We've not done that as a nation. And to me, that is what the opportunity is. And when we think about scoring and, and auditing agencies, it is really an opportunity for us to get back the notion of accountability. You know, take, take an entity like HUD. It can't continue to put billions of dollars out on one side of the house, but then get rid of the affirmatively furthering fair housing rule. <laughs> you know, you can't have harm being done by our governing institutions. And at the same time, then asking communities, what's the return on investment? We're undercutting that work. And so, um, to me, the executive order and this next generation of data work is about us beginning to hold government accountable for remaking itself into what we needed to be for a multiracial democracy. That's what's so exciting. And there's plenty in that, in that, in that um, I guess, in the definition of all. You think about 100 plus million folks in this country struggling to make ends meet. 26 million are white. I'm not just talking about black and brown folks. The design of this nation isn't working for large swaths of people. And the opportunity that we have with this data work and with this executive order is to begin to get that 100 million number going down. So I want to ask uh, both of you a related set of questions around the use of data. One of the uh, questions we got in the chat was, give, give me examples of what does it mean to be actionable? How are we going to have this data in hand and do something different? And Michael, let me ask you to ask, answer that question, particularly in the context of advocates and people on the ground, um, often who are seeking policy change from actors. Um, you know, in some ways, data is a, a hard for some people to access, but on the other hand, it, it is it grants people power. So, how do you see? The, the, the role of disaggregating and the federal government providing it, changing the nature of the conversation in our country about policy outcomes. I believe that when we create the right data infrastructure, it should be used by advocates to hold people accountable and to advance their agenda. The National Equity Atlas that we stood up is does just that. A perfect example is us designing the Renner's Week of Action data profiles, and even right now, a lot of the eviction moratoria using our data sets to make the case for that. Advocates are using that data to make the case for impacts as well as why the, the eviction moratorium should be extended. And so it, it, that is fundamental. Now, the, the thing about data is I don't think it can be coupled, decoupled from the leadership task. It's not gonna make you do anything if your head and your heart aren't right. I mean, and that's just the reality of it, right? We've been getting intoxicated by data for a long time. <laughs> the question now is if we want to do different work, new data is required, but there's enough data right now for us to act. That's why I use that 100 million. That 100 million number has been around for a long time. It's a lot of folks struggling. And so as we think about data, as we think about leadership, the thing that we've got to begin to, to really put front and center is this hierarchy of human value in this country that says some folks are more valuable than others. And you see that even with the COVID response. Other nations, if we were just to look at data, have shown us how to subsidize wages and ensure that folks do not face eviction, are able to care for their families. In this nation, we question whether folks are even deserving of $300 or $600, not per month, just one-time payments. I mean, think about the gross, grossness of that. Um, data isn't going to help you if that's where your heart is. 
If that is where your heart is, you, we, you, data is the least of your problems. And as a nation, we really need to understand that. Data is the least of our worries if we don't deal with this hierarchy of human value. Because what we're doing in terms of how we're treating each other and the lack of accountability for our institutions, of our governing institutions, is we're creating a, a data set that's telling us one thing. It's going to be awful for a whole lot of folks for a long time. So, uh, Lonzo, uh, I think probably picking up on those points, um, uh, what do you see as the role of philanthropy in this effort? How do you uh, assist the public sector? Um, how do you assist uh, advocates and others for, to engage with the public sector? How do you advance the data infrastructure and how do you make sure that the data infrastructure uh, is uh, supporting its use in the context of real people in real lives? Well, you know, philanthropy um, is always going to be a catalyst, convener, coordinator. Um, you know, um, those of us in the, found, in the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation who ran large public health systems, we had much larger than the annual grant making budget. We have the foundation and I didn't transform Seattle King County or Boston. Uh, so, it's, so it is careful leverage of money, particularly around other systems investments to make these kind of changes. Uh, both changes in attitudes and changes in the kind of data that you collect. And I think uh, I, I really like what Michael said, because you have to change your mindset about what and who is meaningful in order to construct the kind of data that helps you lead toward equitable policies. So uh, in the grant making that we do, it's supporting meaningful data, data that can be used, that is transparent by communities who can see themselves, not just in the problems they have, but in the assets they have and build toward collaborations, power, uh, solutions, building community power in order to affect the kind of changes that they wanna make. And we've done that in many different ways. Uh, our, our, our program, our DASH programs that works with a, a variety of, of small community organizations around the country, um, bringing data people want to see in their communities to solve problems that they want to solve in partnership. It's that kind of meaningful data, but I, I really want to keep emphasizing it's not just all deficit data, it's asset data and, and, and building on those, on those data. But it's also looking, I'll mention a couple of things from our COVID experience. Um, many data sets popped up that weren't governmental. Uh, some of the best dashboards that, uh, that came up were from other groups that had better visualization and community groups. So we want to make sure when we're thinking about data of the future, that is government plus other sectors, other uh, participants in, in developing uh, those, those, those data systems. Um, so Alonzo, you gave one example. I'm getting a, a, a bunch of questions in the chat about, give me an example. What, what do we learn in disaggregated data that we wouldn't otherwise know? So make, just make this conversation uh, concrete. Um, and you did, uh, Lonzo, talk a little bit about housing data combined with health data. So I'm going to ask you, Michael, to go first and give us an example of decision making that when you have more granular information of one kind or another, you can make a different kind of choice. Well, a really good example is in California with COVID when it comes to reopening. Um, we helped on the governor's task force and we helped them put an equity indicator, a metric in place. Um, because if you just look at the data in aggregate, you could actually open up and say everything's fine when actually the communities who have been hurting first and worst are still suffering. When they went back in and decided to put that equity metric in, it put greater pressure on folks to target the resources to those who really needed it the most. That is the perfect example of uh, looking at a municipality in the aggregate wasn't telling the entire story. Yes, some folks might have been doing better, but those, those frontline workers and those communities where those frontline workers still resided, their numbers weren't improving. And so Gover by Governor Newsom putting that indicator in place, it put pressure on folks to be accountable for not just glossing over the community and trying to hide the numbers and open up just because those of us who can work at home are doing well, it forced them to actually didn't deal with the problem of the neighborhoods where people are still struggling and being left behind. So that equity indicator is still in effect now. Alonzo, other examples? Well, an example of, of, uh, of where the disaggregation is really important and you need better leading indicators is it took 
the nation too long to see how disproportionately impacted uh, indigenous populations, Native American populations were because of the lack of having sufficiently granular data and resources uh, in those areas of the country to be able to provide that data very quickly. Um, I mean, I think it, we abound in exam negative examples around the data not being there where we find out risk uh, and unfair health outcomes after the fact. But I, I think that um, and one of the, I think another example of, of very good granular data that we don't use uh, both on prevention and, uh, and also uh, um, response is um, 211 data. Uh, in, uh, from uh, the United Ways worldwide. That is a wonderful leading indicator of the social nexus of risk uh, at a very local level. Um, and uh, we don't do enough with uh, that level of very local data that's tied to local delivery systems. Uh, so the, the long-term systems building and policy solutions are also very local. Um, and, and need to be driven by that local data. So those are, are, are two kind of examples. But, you know, uh, 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 data wonks, uh, like many of us, have got to learn to uh, make those data clear and accessible and reflect problems people want to solve and, and become a tool in them solving those problems. And I'll take the moderator's prerogative to mention an example my colleagues did that I'm very proud of. Um, when the early job loss numbers were coming in from the pandemic, um, we often didn't know much about who was losing their jobs. Um, but we did know uh, a bit about where job losses were happening. And we started to be able to uh, know that in those geographies, what was the mix of which sectors, I'm sorry, which sectors were we seeing job losses in? And if we were seeing job losses in certain sectors and we knew in other data sets, something about who lived in those places and what kind of employment they had, you could start to predict. Even if you didn't have the data yet, you could predict at a more granular level which neighborhoods were going to see job losses, even if we'd have seen them in New York, but we hadn't seen them in parts of the country that hadn't seen the pandemic yet. Nonprofits, local governments could target their uh, housing of, uh, resources, their food bank services and other things into neighborhoods because we put different data sets together. And it wasn't perfect information, but it was good enough at the time of decision to help you make a choice that probably helped um, many families avoid worse circumstances. Um, and one other thing I would say, we talk about disaggregating the data in the abstract, but let's talk about the populations here. Federal government data tends to be about white, always, by the way, the first column and thus the norm. We send signals in how we graph and represent data, but often it's white, black, and other. Sometimes you have Latinx or Hispanic as the feds call it. Um, think about the diversity within those categories and think about the, particularly for Asian American, where very often we don't even have data at all, but there's so many different cultural experiences within that. And to try to understand and provide services to those communities um, with that lack of information is a huge priority for these kinds of efforts, I would argue as well. Right. Um, uh, we're gonna have to close in one moment. So I just wanted to ask each of you, as you think about this area of work, what's most important next? What are you watching from the federal government? How can they really help us to accelerate? And what um, is the promise you're most excited about? Uh, sorry, uh, uh, Lanza, why don't you go first? Well, I mean, I think it, we've it's opened up um, belatedly the need to <laughs> focus on this in a real and sustainable way. Even just the racial ethnicity disaggregation that is just way overdue. You mentioned the Asian Pacific Islander population it, as if that was one <laughs> Thing. It is so. It is many, many things. Um, the same for all of these categories of, of race and ethnicity. Um, so uh, we need. It's it's good that that's been opened up, but there's a lot more work that we need to do to understand the impact of those of, of race and ethnicity on health outcomes. But the real issue on affecting health is not the race ethnicity. It is the racism attendant to that, and we need metrics that understand that that structural racism, how it's manifested and how to uh, change that. Thank you, Alonzo. Close us out, Michael. Alonzo nailed that that issue of being able to see systems and how they harm or, or do good. 
um, we need to be able to have greater insight into those. This is a moment for us, as I said, to remake our governing institutions and to redesign the nation, our framework, our legal framework, so that it works for everyone. And we need the data necessary to help make the case, designing a new legal and regulatory framework that lives into the spirit of equity de definition, and then to be able to have governing institutions that can carry out that framework in a just and fair way. Nice small mission for all of us, but one we're glad to have all of our participants here today excited about as well. Thank you, Alonzo and Michael for joining us. Uh, and with that, we will welcome an, another group of local government leaders and Urban Zone, Sheena Ashley. Take care, Michael. Take care, Alonzo. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. So great. We are now really pleased to welcome first Urban's uh, Vice President uh, of our Center on Nonprofits Philanthropy, Sheena Ashley. And as I mentioned, Sheena is part of the team that worked together to put together the Racial Equity Analytics Lab. Uh, Kelly Jin, uh, formerly now, congratulations on your new uh, soon to be role, but uh, until recently in the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics in New York City. And Candace Moore, Chicago's very own first chief equity officer. Thank you all three of you for being here. So Sheena, why don't you uh, start us up? You guys, you've been leading this effort uh, with your colleagues here at Urban to help us contribute to this conversation. So how are you thinking about the problem of disaggregating data and its potential? Thank you so much, Sarah. And I am so energized by the start of this conversation already. So <laughs> hopefully I don't get too excited. But let me also take a second and acknowledge some of that team you mentioned. Uh, Real has been really developed out of the energy and passion of so many at the Urban Institute. I'll name just a few, but everyone knows who they are who've been participating in this. Stephen Brown, Megan Randall, Graham McDonald, and Elena Stern from the data and science team. And we've been advised by key experts like Monique king Villan, Michael Dyche, March Turner, Danny Rose, so many who have poured so much effort into Real, and I'm so excited about the launch of this effort. I'm in this next conversation, I think exhibits and brings to the front the, the users, the people who Real was um, envisioned to support. We started Real to really be a resource and to meet a demand that we saw out in the community that there are so many uh, equity focused leaders who were civic leaders, philanthropic leaders, business leaders who want to be moving on equity, who really want to be advancing sustained equitable impact in the communities where they sit, but saw that every, every time I went into different communities, they would say, well, we're limited in data. We would love to be able to see it this way, but we don't have the data access. And particularly real-time data is where the gaps were for these leaders. And there were two trends that I was really seeing and being excited about emerging. On the one hand, you see this incredible pattern of equity-focused leaders who were getting equity titles in communities like chief diversity officers and chief equity officers. And this whole crew of people trained by groups like GAIR and National League of Cities. And then on the other hand, being a very stats data focused person, you had all of these data and technology folks who were coming at this problem from a city innovation technology perspective, but really centered on equity. And what we've been able to see is both of these emerging fields really sit sitting at the point of defining this new vision for what data in the service of racial equity needs to look like and coming at it from these two different ways. So I'm very excited to have Candace and Kelly here representing the interests of those groups and representing all the equity focused leaders out there to just share with us a little bit more of their thinking, their work and what they bring to this field. Uh, perfect segue, uh, Sheena. Thank you. And literally, these two represent these powerful forces, and seeing them work together is really great. So, Kelly, uh, why don't we talk a little bit first about the needs of a city uh, data infrastructure officer, particularly? You know, New York has been at the forefront of using data analytics to support delivery of services and policy making in a city. Um, so, I think you're uh, in a place to show how having that kind of information at your fingertips matters. Um, but this notion of ever more increasing disaggregate data, why is that so powerful? What would you use, uh, what would you use it for? Let's make this very concrete and real for folks. 
Sure, thanks, Sarah, and, and thanks, folks, for having uh, me today. Um, I, I kind of break it down into a couple different uh, pieces, many of which are the lessons learned from the last year and kind of being on, on the ground. The first is how do we figure out baking in data disaggregation at the start? Uh, so I know that you know Michael and Lonzo touched upon this, but when you think about data collection in the actual forms that you're filling out, you know I'm sure all of you have gone out and hopefully been tested over the last couple of months. Um, I myself have been looking at the data that has been aggregated uh, of myself as an Asian American, and at the same time I'm in there like filling out the form and like clicking on the button and remembering that oftentimes in an emergency, we don't have really the luxuries of, okay, let's think about what are all of the data elements that we're trying to track and be able to measure later on. And so for me, I, I very, very much feel like both with real, but a lot of efforts across the entire country in different communities, that being able to bring a lot of that expertise up front so that folks know, okay, these are resources of people who understand measures, equity measures, along with the data folks together at the outset, um, I think can, can definitely make huge strides as we enter into vaccine and vaccination territory, uh, as well as uh, beyond as we're thinking about recovery for uh, the pandemic generally. The second, I am going to be the technologist here um, to talk a little bit more about bringing external data in. Uh, so this is briefly touched upon in, in the last session, but I remember early on, and I know this is true across the country, the data that government actually has. So when we think about the, the data coming in from labs and public health departments, uh, as well as city data. So let's take, you know, 211 data was mentioned. 311 data uh, is quite a giant treasure trove in New York City. When we think about all these different data sets, uh, there is kind of misrepresentation or not a complete representation of uh, different communities, different locations throughout any jurisdiction. And so as I think in the future, I think about how can governments as well as the broader ecosystem start to invest in like, how do you actually weave all of these different webs together uh, to provide a, a bigger picture as to what's going on in a current state. Uh, and uh, last but not least in terms of data disaggregation. So this does all come back to, uh, I think uh, what is exciting about the 46th administration uh, is how do we start to set more standards uh, that is both going to be bottom up from different jurisdictions as well as cross country uh, coordination across states and, and cities. Um, I see that there are more than 600 participants. I'm very, very hopeful there are folks uh, actually listening in from the 46th administration. So uh, definitely uh, excited that folks are, are hearing more about the panelists today on all these measures. That's great. Thank you so much. And Candice, um, how are your team at the Chicago Office of the Chief Equity Officer uh, thinking and using data, particularly um, as you try to help the city deal with the COVID crisis. Um, I think of Chicago as the first place really we saw data coming out to tell us how horrifically this pandemic was affecting disproportionately some communities instead of others. So how is this helping your political leadership and all of your agency colleagues um, make different choices? Yeah, absolutely. And I'd also thank you for having me. Um, it, it's sort of interesting for me to personally to think about how much I'm utilizing data in my work. Um, there's this sort of age old joke about lawyers like go to a law school because they didn't want to deal with numbers. Uh, and, I, you know, I'm not going to lie, I live into that a little bit. Um, but when I step back and really think about the way that me and my team have been working, um, especially around COVID, um, um, and some of the um, innovations and I think exciting uh, things that we've been able to do, I, I am reminded that data has really been core to so much of our work. Um, some specific examples are, um, you mentioned how Chicago was really um, one of the first cities to, to sort of as a city acknowledge the disparities that were happening around COVID, but also own the responsibility to do something about it. I remember those conversations very vividly. Um, see our Department of Public Health, CDPH, um, uh, 
is a powerhouse in pulling together mm -hmm. data mm -hmm. about health disparities, disaggregating it, breaking it down by community mm -hmm. area. So mm -hmm. we had a strong foundation to build off of so that they could tell us we had a problem. And then we could all see the problem really clearly. And I think that was really important for our administration. Um, now, what was also true is that um, in seeing and, and to acknowledging the problem, our mayor really pushed us that we got to do something about it. So we're not here to admire the problem or just say, oh, isn't this bad? Um, even in the constraints of systemic inequality that has been formed over years and decades before us, there's still a thing we can do. So let us press and let us think about what we can do. And so one of the really important innovations for us was developing our racial equity rapid response team. And what I'll say specific about data when it comes to that team is that we brought communities most impacted by the data that we were seeing to the table to help us understand the, understand the data that we were seeing. And what that did for us in terms of really then be, being able to break down where the barriers were and what more could we be doing um, was to really empower our communities, but ultimately just drive at better solutions. They saw things um, that we didn't see because we didn't live there. Um, they knew things about their community. We actually sh were able to share clarifying points for them around the, the information that they were hearing about their own communities. A good example is around mortality data. So if you looked at certain communities, you would see high numbers of mortality when it came to COVID. But to break that data down, you could better understand whether it's coming from a nursing home, for instance, versus community spread versus, and these points matter when you're talking about what kinds of interventions you might use. And so us knowing that, our communities knowing that, and then ultimately being able to co-create and build solutions together, I think has been absolutely the game changer for our city. Um, and um, I feel like that has proven up not only in the strategies that we've been able to implement, but the relationships relationships ultimately that we've been able to build and solidify during during so much of the work. I, I love Candace how you talk about um, data. Data doesn't end the conversation, it's the beginning, but it can help organize the conversation. And the, the key is then how ethically do you act to uh, create a conversation whose voices are at the table about what do we do next? Um, it sounds like you're describing you know the kind of model that we all should be thinking about. Um, Sheena, um, we've been talking a lot about um, uh, ethic, uh, um, doing this right. Um, uh, you know, in particular, and have colleagues here who are working with you on some of the real risks, however, data has been used historically, not always in ways that um, serve the benefits of the people represented in numbers. Um, can you identify some of these ethical challenges and how do we also build a kind of norms and, and, and practices that are uh, make sure we use F, uh, data in the way that uh, we'll be happy to people to study years from now. Absolutely. I think we are well aware on this team that even as we use data in the pursuit of racial justice, we, we have to also reckon with the fact that we ourselves can cause harm in our use of these data. And there are some harms that we've been starting to talk about and actually producing some products around. Um, uh, to name some of them, there's the possibility for consent violations. A lot of the work that we're doing in the Racial Equity Analytics Lab is imputing data and matching data bringing racial identifiers from other data sources into others. And in doing that, you know, did people consent for our use of that when they originally signed on those forms like Kelly's talking about? Did they want them to be used for other purposes? Um, there's the, the potential for privacy and confidentiality violations when we are trying to go to the micro geographies that Alonzo talked about. People can be identified in those apartments. And so is that something that puts them at some particular risk? There's the risk of us replicating bias in the underlying data for which we match these data on when we're building into our algorithms and our applications. And also just building what Michael said, we have the risk of failing to center the personhood of the people who are behind these data, the people who, whose lives are represented. And so when we start thinking about, we can pull from this data set and match them into this, these are, these are people who we can't just bring their lives together. So we have to pay attention to both the impacts of the disaggregated data that we use, 
but also on the input side. And this is something I'm really passionate about is thinking about who is creating these desegregated data as we bring the, the power of the ability to do this. Do the people behind these data sets, codes, and algorithms have the training? Have, do they have the racial bias training? Are they thinking from a critical race theory perspective on the ways in which they can be causing harm? And, and are they embedded in institutional settings where they are empowered to voice their concerns about risk? So are they, being, are they working in climates and in work climates where they are free to be able to say, we should not use these data in the way that we think that we want to, or this report actually causes some potential harm, let's not release it. And there has to be that sort of institutional support as well that creates that context for people to be thinking about those risks. Um, a big agenda of work to do, um, even as we're rushing ahead, we're trying to make sure you be mindful of all of that at the same time. Um, so Candace and, and Kelly, uh, we were talking in the earlier discussion uh, about the president's new executive order. And the, it really focuses at least at first blush on how federal agencies uh, do decision-making. But of course, many of the programs that they're doing decision-making about end up being implemented and create uh, work and uh, also resources for the communities that you come from. Um, does this feel to you like something happened far away and it won't have any effect on uh, cities? Or is there a way that this focus at the federal level on data infrastructure and disaggregation uh, and eventually empowering race conscious decision making can, can, can do anything to make your worlds more effective? What would be your wish from federal actors for support in one form or another whether through incentive or what they require of you in order to gain access to federal money or the information they provide? What could federal actors do to help create more equitable decision-making in the local level? Candace, why don't you start us? Yeah, I think a few different thoughts are firing off in my head. One is, is um, I just think about how can federal agencies learn from uh, the, the sort of lower, smaller jurisdictions about what the experience of their services and programs uh, are and what they have on communities. I think the ability, I, when I think about equity, I, I, I always think about how do you better understand how people most impacted uh, by a system or a policy or a practices are experiencing whatever you're talking about. So what does it look like to actually have that kind of through line where folks uh, at the city level for instance, can really talk about what seems like a big, large federal program, but ultimately has impact. Um, how can they share their data with us to help us understand what is happening in context outside of us? Um, we're not on an island, we are deeply impacted. How does the data, data that the federal government um, um, uh, collect really then work to empower communities, empower cities, states, et cetera, in problem solving and better understanding patterns or impacts that are happening in other places that quite frankly, at a city level, you just don't have time to do that and uh, to analyze that. You're trying to triage so many things at the ground level. It's, it, it's helpful to have those kinds of um, through lines and understanding. So those are some of the things that jump out to me. Kelly? I absolutely just want to echo Candace on uh, the benchmarking point. I think there's a lot to be said about the federal government's uh, ability to convene and the power to convene different communities and for communities to, to learn from one another. I think philanthropy um, obviously always serves a, a role in, in that capacity, um, but I'm very, very excited to see uh, more of that happening in the upcoming months. Um, the second piece that I'll, I'll briefly touch upon is the funding of data infrastructure uh, and data acquisition. Uh, so this is, you know, many of you I'm sure are familiar with the federal government does fund, uh, whether through academic institutions or at local jurisdictions, uh, the standing up of infrastructure, which is oftentimes a difficult budget proposition to, to make. And then increasingly the fact that there are really, really high value uh, data sets that can be aggregated and anonymized in certain ways for local jurisdictions to use for their decision-making. I think a lot, a lot of work could be done there 
um, most notably, hopefully with um, uh, FEMA support. Um, and this kind of brings me to my uh, last point on this for the moment, but for federal government really, really, really to remember to be hiring and bringing on people with local government experience. Um, so I am very excited. I'm sure you all have been following uh, some of the, the nominees, um, but uh, the NISM commissioner, emergency management commissioner um, to be nominated as, as head of FEMA, um, uh, Polly Trottenberg as deputy secretary at, at DOT, and of course, many, many other uh, uh, nominations really excite me because I myself, um, when I was working at the White House in 2016, remembers being the only person in the room with local government experience and people turning to me and asking, you know, what, like, what would you think about this if we were implementing a, a policy? So I do also think about the actual people uh, in the room uh, within the federal government. Um, absolutely. So Sheena, just quick question. Uh, uh, Kelly mentioned earlier, but I wanted to ask you to pick up on this um, uh, about the role of the private sector. So, you know, federal government data is collected very rigorously. It has really high quality frequency, timeliness, not so good. So uh, nonprofits do, I mean, for, the for-profit sector has very different incentives, obviously proprietary interest in retaining that information, but under the right circumstances, when we're able to mine it or share it, there's all kinds of insight to be found. How can that work so that everyone's interests are, assigned, are, are aligned and the values you were talking about before are protected? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think Kelly can speak to some of the private groups that they've worked with in New York City, if she can disclose. Uh, but it would be great to just hear some of those examples and where that brought in new insight. But we are really excited about the data that private sector organizations have and that they've been more willing to create data sharing agreements to have de-identified data shared with researchers for that because it's so key to real-time data. I mean, with the limited resources we do have for federal data that have racial identifiers or that can be matched on, they these things are collected annually at best every four years. And so to be able to make some uh, real strategy decisions and to guide action in real time, sometimes our only source for information is from private sector groups who are collecting this as a course of their business. And you know there are ways in which they can de-identify and share so that they are able to maintain the confidentiality of their customers and protect the, the assets that they have there. And we saw some great examples. I mean, the work that we're doing with Real came out of a direct learning from the work that JP Morgan Chase Institute was doing with some of the matching of the data they were doing. And from our early work with the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth, where they had a data philanthropy agreement with us that helped us build the infrastructure to think about how we can ingest private sector data and have all of the issues. And some of the work that we're doing at Urban Around data privacy and synthetic data build on the requirements that were needed for us to be able to handle the private sector data. And so I think the, the private sector are key partners in this work. Um, and also will see value to themselves from either producing their own reports with this knowledge or partnering with organizations to do something with the data. Kelly, do you wanna talk at all about some of the work that you guys are doing? I'm excited about receiving LinkedIn sure. data. Yeah. <laughs> Sure, and um, uh, for those of you interested in, and have a little bit more time, you can go to nyc.gov slash recovery data, one word. So all of the partners uh, are, are all published there. Um, some of the really interesting insights uh, were with working with LinkedIn, uh, Street Easy, which is Zillow Group's brand in New York City, to be able to understand what was earlier mentioned as kind of economic sector data and this higher level information that you could use as proxies. So I think that when we think about specific neighborhoods uh, or here in, in the city, you know, neighborhood tabulation areas or different ways that you break down the data, um, oftentimes private sector companies are collecting or not collecting uh, that data because their primary constituent group are all of the users of those softwares and platforms. And so something that we spent a lot of time and energy on is how do we do this responsibly and deliberately? So on the, the site, you'll see um, a lot of the examples of the use cases that uh, agencies have been using the data for, uh, as well as we made public the data sharing uh, agreement and template. Um, I, I just wanna say like, 
I feel like to folks who don't work in the data field, like data sharing agreements are not the most exciting thing. They are the most exciting thing to me ever because a lot of the work that we're trying to do, and I see it, Shana, you're, you're nodding your head, comes down to how do we actually write these legal agreements um, between different entities and, and institutions. And until you get to that brass tax level, oftentimes when you're talking about how do we, you know, how do we analyze data, um, it's not unless you've cleared some of these hurdles uh, that you're actually able to get this analysis work done. And I actually think there's a whole business to be done in publishing uh, the templates for these documents so that not everyone has to reinvent the wheel. So Candace, I'm gonna ask you to close us out. Um, you used an expression in our prep call that I thought was really powerful, which was sort of about uh, numbers and narratives. And we have a bunch of questions uh, in the chat about political will. And even when the numbers are there, do, do leadership act on numbers? So between uh, what is the power of uh, numbers and what is the power of stories and narrative to help build political will? Yeah, I mean, I think they go hand in hand. Numbers can tell me a lot about a problem, a situation, a circumstance, uh, can capture quite a lot, but there is so much in the connection, the context, the historical narrative, how people process it, how, that, that we have to capture, especially if we're talking about moving and advancing. I always say that in, in my work, I, one, of, one of the things I'm trying to tap into is people's sense of why, why does this matter? Um, yes, data can be one way I make the case, but sometimes it's the personal story, it's the context, it's connected to the history, it's connected to a sense of hope. And so, especially as I do my work um, at the city level in partnership with communities, in partnership with staff and employees in, in, in the city, I can't ever forget of how important, I can't ever forget how important the why is um, in trying to move folks. Um, I'm not here just making sort of legal arguments from on high or number arguments from on high, but trying to help people see their place in, in, in a system and their ability and their power to move and to grow and to create opportunities. Um, and so that, that, that constant reminder to marry our numbers with our narratives, our stories, our, our histories, our context is just something that I think then really brings a lot of power to the work and then um, brings more people into the fold. It's, it's not one or the other, it's actually about the power of synthesis to get to real change. Um, we are uh, sad but very happy here at Urban to have seen a number of our colleagues uh, join the state and local government folks who are going in uh, to government. So we have some hope that there is uh, an understanding of the power of knowledge together with the perspective of people that can, can get us to the right answers. Um, I wanted to say a word of thanks to all of you and to Michael and Alonzo, before them, Sheena, and to every single person who has done anything to help get us to real to this day. My deepest gratitude and pride in your work. It's such a cool accomplishment for us to bring all these capacities together to be able to join the, the, the community of people who are trying to accelerate solutions in this space. I'm so proud of this effort and I'm so grateful to all of you for being with us. And we look forward to seeing you back here again and follow, sign up for real newsletters as soon as we, well, we have all your names, we're gonna send them out to you. So say, say yes, everyone be well, be safe. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Sarah. Bye. Bye.